I grew up in Chicago. Um, anybody who's been to Chicago, you know Chicagoans have a tendency to blather and talk a lot and have fun and laugh. I mean, that's just kind of what the city is. Yesterday, uh, Gary and I were driving around and uh, reflecting on what he said. He said, where, where do you think your sense of humor came from? And the answer to that question has always been, well, I grew up in Chicago. My mom was Irish and uh, played the piano and was largely alive. And I grew up around Irish people, and they're hilarious, and they love the language. And, and then I got an Italian side, and so there was a lot of fighting going on in that house. And, and that was always the story until Gary asked me the question yesterday. I said, well, I've actually had an experience where I got to examine and see and hang out with my higher self. I got to see my higher self. And I got to witness myself, literally, the way I am right now, speaking in a lectern, talking to a group of people. I'll tell you how that came about. But as I witnessed myself, this higher self talking, I thought, what the? <laughs> that guy's pretty funny. <laughs> he's got a sense of humor. Where does that come from? Oh, I see. That's what, that's what he's always been. He's always been playful, that guy. <laughs> And when I got to examine many lifetimes through this therapy, which I'll get to how I got to that, I saw that within each lifetime, there was that wisp, there was that ethereal smoke of that sense of humor. However, as I pointed out in my session, <coughs> it's not until this lifetime that I've been able to sort of act like I do over there. Okay? What does that mean? So, in a, in, a, in a very broad and, um, way, basically a friend of mine passed away, uh, as you know from the book and people who've seen the film and stuff, a friend of mine passed away in my arms back in 1996 here in Culver City. And very close, I'd always felt very close to her, and um, when she passed, it was interesting, the clocks in her uh, house stopped at four o'clock, and I watched her two cats watch something fly around the room in unison. You know, cats like do that thing where they do that. And they look over there. So they watch something sort of in, in the trajectory as I'm watching the cats as she like flew up and out and gone. And I had had some unusual visions around her passing. I had sort of been hanging out with her. And the night before she passed, I had a very unusual phone call in the middle of the night. Phone rang, picked it up. It's Tony, you page me. Remember when pagers were like popular? <laughs> Some guy had dialed my number. It's Tony. Um, Tony, I'm sorry, I didn't page you. It's like four in the morning, wow, okay. I got the phone, so I was awake. And I closed my eyes, and suddenly, I felt like the most violent shaking of the apartment I was in. The, the roar of like a train coming through, but much louder. <coughs> so intense, I thought it was an earthquake. I had already lived through the 94 quake. I thought, oh my god, what is this? And I realized it's not a quake. I'm experiencing something that's ethereal, spiritual, I guess. And the roof of the building, <coughs> the apartment, just disappeared. And a shaft of light just came blasting down onto me. And it was so intense, the noise, the shaking, the light. It was just really an amazing, intense experience. And then I heard my friend Luana, this is her name, right over my shoulder saying, isn't this fucking amazing? <laughs> now she was about 58, 59 when she passed. This was 1995, 96. Never heard her say that bomb <laughs> in a sentence like that casually. When she was in her 20s, yeah, she was an actress. She was kind of known for that. You know, she wasn't from New York, but she could talk like she was. <laughs> so it was unusual to hear her say that, but I was aware that it was her voice, no question about it. But it was her voice when she was about 20. I didn't know her then, but I've seen movies she was in, so I know what her voice sounded like, but it was a 20-year-old's voice. And as I was trying to see where I was, I could see I was in some kind of a shaft, almost like a volcano. I could see that the walls around me were glowing red. I was aware that I was on some kind of a platform that was rising up. And then I realized I was actually in the platform. I wasn't lying on it. I was actually, whatever, part of the clay. 
moving forward towards a light, a bright light. But the, the experience was so intense, I, I passed out, fainted. And a few minutes later, I guess, I woke up. But I was still in it. It was still happening. It hadn't gone away. I was now further along. And I, as I got to the very end of this, whatever you want to call it, volcano, I could see sparks, like these lights, crinkling and, and, and you know, sort of exploding around me. And then I felt the distinct experience of moving up into this other, but diffi with difficulty. So the way, remember how television sets used to be? You change a channel, and there'd be that weird line between you know, channel A and channel B, or six and seven. Yeah. For those of those pre-remote people, <laughs> you know, that's the way we used to turn TVs, you know, you turn the channel <laughs> off. And you actually literally are going from one wavelength to the next. And in between those wavelengths, they kind of have like a separation there. And you can see it. You could see it on TVs, I guess, because here I was seeing it between volcano and something else. And at that moment, I said, I don't think I'm supposed to go here with you. <laughs> and then I passed out, fell asleep. And I woke up the next morning thinking, oh my god, I must have witnessed her passing. But I hadn't. This was the day before she passed. I had witnessed something. I didn't know what it was. So I set it aside, because I had things to do. I had to go deal with her and her passing and her turning to me and saying her what I, at the time I thought were her last words. Ha, ha, ha. Mm -hmm. Which now I realize when people tell you what their last words were, they're the first words you say into the next realm. Steve Jobs, last words, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. Henry Ford, that's very beautiful over there. Napoleon. Josephine. Soldier. General. Fifth Regiment. That's what he said. Like he was reporting for duty. <laughs> Here. Get that thing out of your... Her last words puzzled me. Wasn't quite sure what she meant by it. I wasn't, you know, sure how to deal with it. So I, I had to set it aside. And, and at some point, I went off to New York City. I was working on the Charles Grodin show, a good friend of ours who introduced us, producing a show and shooting stuff out in the street. And one day, had this idea like, ah, where is she? If she was there talking in my ear at age 20, before she died. Therefore, she must exist outside of her body on some level. And therefore, where is she? And the answer came. I was lying in my apartment in the Upper West Side, 76 and Broadway. Um, you know, afternoon, kind of tired, laid down. Started to have an out-of-body experience, which how many of you have ever had any one of those? You sort of fly around the room. Sometimes you get a buzzing sensation. Sometimes you're resisting it, and sometimes it's like, "Wow, here we go!" Wee. You know, and then you wake up the next day, and like, "God, I'm tired." I don't really <laughs> feel like I'm. Kind of, well, in this case, I felt myself rise up out of my body and shoot up into space. Never had that experience, but it was shooting up into space, and I looked below, and I saw New York City disappear like the power of 10. Woo! And I looked this way, and now I was traveling at this incredible rate of speed. So fast that light was melting around me. I was aware of it. And then I suddenly up, took a turn, and I was going this direction, but it felt like I was bouncing around, and if you want to call it a wormhole, like some people, when I saw the movie Contact, I went, oh, that's it. <laughs> but I was moving this way, and then when I got through to the other side, I was moving at the same rate of speed in another, I can only say, it felt like another universe, light, dark stars, but going this way instead of that way. And I came to a full stop, and there she was. Her eyes were closed, she opened them and looked at me, as if to say, you were looking for me, here I am. And at that moment, some knucklehead honked his truck horn outside my window. 
Before I could be like, where are we? <laughs> what are you doing? How did I get here? Where's my spacesuit? Can I breathe? <laughs> Is there a cappuccino? <laughs> Somebody honked his horn and I was yanked back like a rubber band. Boom! And I went right back within before the guy's hand came off the horn. And I saw New York coming up at me at a great rate of speed. And I was awake, oh. conscious. <sighs> okay, what the heck was that? So that's when that began my journey. That's why we're here today, <laughs> that experience. Basically, I started, uh, Robert Thurman became a friend of mine. He's a Tibetan philosopher, the head of Tibetan studies at Columbia. He had written a translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which I thought, well, then they must know what the dead are doing. So let me follow that path. And so I ended up going to Tibet with him. Went to, uh, we sh I shot a documentary about going around Mount Kailash with him for Tibet House. Um, and what I found about, I found out, are you familiar with Buddhism? Pretty much so. Mm -hmm. The tenets kind of say that between lives we're like wisps of smoke, and depending on our karma, we wind up in a birth. And if we've been bad or something, you know, inappropriate, we have a what they call a lesser birth, and that you get a higher birth if you've had good karma. I mean, that's the theory. And that's what the Tibetan Book of the Dead is, basically. It's a wonderful book about hospice care. I mean, because I've read the hospice, sort of what happens, and it's identical to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, except for this one area. So, and ultimately, I've had this debate with Robert Thurman, which is, the, who wrote the Tibetan Book of the Dead? And it's one monk, basically, who passed the tradition down. He had the experience, and he passed it down. And many, many monks have written about the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but one monk, and my argument to him was, once I come into this research, what about 7,000 people having an experience, and it's identical? Wouldn't you want to pay attention to that, or at least look at it, to see what the difference is? So that's the, fund the fundamental difference between that ph religious philosophy and many reincarnation philosophies, the fundamental difference between that and what this research shows, what the data shows, is that we are fully conscious between lives. We choose who we're going to be. We choose the stones in our path so we can learn from them. And we come here as a form of agreement with our soul group so we can all experience these things together. Okay, that's a pretty bold statement to make. So, what happened to me was, after I studied that, thank you, see, you're doing the same thing I am, after I studied that, I sort of went to Tibet with the sermon. I came back and it just didn't resonate with me what I was hearing. Because I had that experience of being fully conscious outside of my body somewhere else. If we're wisps of smoke between lives, how can I be fully, you see? How could she be fully aware over there? Or, or aware of relatively so? <coughs> anyway. So that didn't really hold it for me. And I was, I went off to London to work on a show, and, and it didn't turn out to be a show, it turned out to be a trip to London. But while I was there, I met an Oxford professor named Robert Beer, um, who had spent a lot of time in Nepal and Tibet. Terrific guy, painter. And when I shook his hand, I had that feeling, we sometimes do. Oh, this is the guy. This is why you're here in London, <coughs> not the show. Him. Thought that was unusual, so I became friends with him. We corresponded back and forth. He wrote to me and said his daughter passed away suddenly, boating accident, 18 years old. Easily the most difficult day of his life. <clears throat> but, he said, on the way to pick up her body, I felt like I was reliving it. Like every day of my life, I knew this was going to happen, and now it had happened. So I was thinking, how could that be? How could he know? So I had read a little bit of um, Ian Stevenson's work, University of Virginia, and Carol Bowman's work, Children's Past Lives. So I sent him a copy, and I said, you know, the, this is research people are doing about children's past lives. They're claiming, you know, this to be the case. And he had gone in down this path and done some research, and he said, well, have you read any Michael Newton? I had not. Six months later, 
handshake became, have you read any Michael Newton? No. Now let me just pause for a second. When Alana was dying, she said to me, I think I know where I'm going. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I have this recurring dream. I'm in a classroom in another galaxy. And in that classroom, everyone's dressed in white. They're speaking a language I've never heard before, but I somehow understand. At the time, I thought, oh, it's the morphine drip. You know. <laughs> she must be imagining that. And then her friend called the day she died and said, oh, I had this wonderful dream about the water last night. She was in the fourth dimension. I was thinking, uh-oh, you know what? And she was in a classroom where everyone was dressed in white. She seemed very happy. Hmm. Now I've met Robert Beer. He's, I've picked up the book, Journey of Souls, chapter one, Life Between Lives. I'm sitting in a classroom, and everyone is dressed in white. Well, if I want to see Luana, that's the, i got to get in that class. What are the credits? You know, how do you, how do you get in? What's the story? And that's what that moment I went, well, if this guy can get me into that class, I can go find her. I can find her on my own. I'm going to take that class and get in there. <laughs> so I contacted uh, the Newton Institute. I said, I'd love to do a documentary about Michael. They said, he's retired. No more interviews. OK, I could have ended it there. But I said, no, you know, what about the conference that's coming up? Can I film that? Yeah, why don't you do that? I thought that was unusual. You want me to just come in and film your conference while you're training people? Yeah, we'd like that. Please. So I flew to Chicago, and I met Michael, and Michael said, OK, I'll do an interview with you. It's my last one. I will never do another. I thought, oh, you're kidding, you know? But no, he was serious. This is it. So I spent a couple hours with him, interviewed him, talked to him about his journey, his path, his research. The skepticism that he had, where he didn't believe that their past life regressions were a valid hyp hypno hypnotherapy tool, and then suddenly somebody had spontaneously, as most of you know, spontaneously, during a session, he had said, take me to the source of your pain, like Dr. Partee in a way, take me to the source of your pain, and he saw himself in a previous life as a British soldier in the Fourth Corps in the Battle of the Somme in 1916 being stabbed by a German. Newton didn't believe him. Really? What's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? What's the name of your bunkmate? What's your address? And as Newton laughs about it later, he's grilling this poor guy who's being stabbed, you know, in his mind, suffering, writhing in the dirt. And he's more interested in, like, what, what's your badge? What's your number? But ultimately, the guy was cured. He had a psychosomatic pain in his shoulder his whole life. That's the way it come to him. And he called me the next day and said, my wife wants to thank you. My shoulder is fine. But that didn't satisfy Michael. As a person that he is, he contacted the war office in England and gave him the details. And did this guy exist? Yes, he did. And his name was this. And he wasn't a fourth. So from that point, Michael Newton started expanding his practice to allowing. And as he said to me, if somebody comes in with a presenting problem, psychosomatic illness and they're cured, why should that be an issue for me? Whether it's true or not, it doesn't really matter because they're, that's the one reason I'm in practice. But, the 19, which is kind of what Brian Weiss's journey has been, but in the 1960s, a client came in, very lonely, depressed, suicidal, and she said, I just don't, I don't belong here. I don't feel I belong. And in the course of her session, he said, take me to the source of your loneliness. Especially if there's a crowd around a group. <clears throat> and she saw herself with her soul group. And they were all sitting around in the life between lives, saying, well, in this life, we're not going to be with you. You need to go and do other stuff. We'll see you later. And she understood it right in that moment. Oh, all of my really close friends are not with me in this life. I agreed to this. Michael Newton said, what? The past life thing was a cold water in his face. And now this, there's some kind of a life between lives. He was like, is this the past? Is this the future? Where are we? And he, she said, it's now. I'm right now with them, and I'm conversing with them. Basically, in a nutshell, 
Michael Newton closed his practice for the next, they closed his practice for public and for this private practice and for the 30 years, he saw 7,000 people who took him to the same place where he mapped out what was going on, what people said, and they all said the same things. Now he's telling me this in an interview, part of my skeptical brain is saying, come on, it can't be. But then I interviewed his wife. And I said to her, when did you, what, what did you think about your husband when he came home and said, there was this light between my stuff? And she said, honestly, I thought they were going to take him away. She had been a nurse. She said, I thought he was nuts until I heard the tapes. Because these tapes show different people from different walks of life coming in and saying the same things. Show me the tapes. That's when I realized, oh. I have to make tapes. If I want to examine this research myself, then I need to put people on camera doing this. And nowadays we have cameras that will film something for eight hours. You know, you don't have to keep changing the lenses and stuff. So I started filming people. And at the conference, they let me film practice sessions. I'll tell you one in a second. Ultimately, it led me to the book, flip side. Scott DeTamble does a number of the sessions. He's in that book. The transcription's there. It's what Scott asked them and what these people say. They're fascinating. Um, Savarna talked a little bit about hybrids. You know, that, kind of, that term that nobody really likes, but the idea that you normally incarnate on another planet and you decided to come here for some reason to help consciousness, that's what they say, okay? It's not me talking. It's not a philosophy. It's not a belief. This is what people say. And they're saying it more often than not. And according to Pete Smith, who's the um, president of the Newton Institute, he corrected me because I was talking about it. He said it's actually about 30% now of the cases that they're getting. I don't know if it's true for you, Smart or Scott, but he was saying it was about 30% where people were saying, yeah, I normally don't come here. <laughs> I normally incarnate somewhere else. Really? So um, it's in the book. But ultimately, uh, they said, yes, you can film a session. So I sat down, and they were doing a practice session. And one of the hypnotherapists was doing a session. I talked to her later. She confirmed that she had never had this past life memory before. Paul Orend, who was then the president of the Institute, conducted the session. It's in the film. It's in the book. But ultimately, this woman went right back to her previous life in Auschwitz, where she had been rounded up in Warsaw with her family taken to Auschwitz. In the course of these, now as a filmmaker, and Paul, I'm sure, can attest to this, when somebody says something really fantastical, dramatic on camera, as a skeptic, you have to go, is this for my benefit? <laughs> I mean, are we in Nazi Germany in the Holocaust, about to go into an oven for my benefit to prove something dramatic? And then I thought, you know, what did he go? <laughs> no, that's not the case. She's just telling the story. So she does, and the therapist took her back to a happier time in her life, and she talked about the family, her love between her relatives, and the connections between all of them. But then we're all ultimately rounded up and taken off and all killed. And she went through that experience of dying, what it was like, and details that you just don't know unless you have to unless you examine them. Zyklon B gas has a sweet smell to it. Things that aren't really reported, but if you do the research, you'll find it's in there. But her spirit goes back to a happier, happier place, and she goes back, and she's with her spirit guide, and she gets to see you know, her soul group, and she's back to being a happy person, and did, you know, to examine things. But at some point, she gets to her council of elders. Let's just call it that for lack of a better term. People who are non-reincarnating entities, if you want to call them that, who help you examine your lifetime, usually from 6 to 12, that's what they say. And in this particular case, I think she had six. And she said to them, I'm asked, she said, I'm asking them, why? Why did I choose this life? It was so difficult. I lost everything. Why would I do that? And then she said, oh, oh, I see. They're showing me, they're showing me it was harder to, 
to choose to play the role of a victim and a perpetrator in this lifetime. And those images were showing that the people who chose to play, play something else, play <coughs> perpetrators, had a harder time of it. Like Patty said earlier, that's the kind of thing where you stop. I stopped. What? Po the most politically incorrect thing I've ever heard in my life. Harder to play the role of a Nazi? I really had to look around the room, <laughs> like, where am I? But then when I stopped questioning it, I started to hear what she was saying. And she said, every, listen, it was difficult, of course. Every day was a lesson in courage. Every day was a lesson in loyalty. Hyper lesson in loyalty and courage and, and giving and compassion for other people in the face of horrific experiences. But the idea that as a human, you could experience courage on such a meta level. Something not all of us could sign up for, let's just say. Now I'm going to skip forward a little bit. So I, I started filming people, and I got addicted to it. <laughs> so I've been filming people since suicide. I continue to film people. And I've been uh, generously asked, invited to come speak at some events a near-death experience, Robin Barr, are you still here? I don't know Robin meant left. But Robin runs the uh, IANDS, IANS Group Institute. Cheryl? International Association for Near-Death Studies. Thank you. And thank God for Cheryl, because Cheryl has started a number of these groups herself. Cheryl Birch back there, we should talk to her. Um, and she has been a very unusual person. She started a group in Virginia Beach. She got me to go and speak there, and that's how I ended up on Coast to Coast, because of that trip in the conversation. But in, take me back, where was I? Robin Barr, what was I saying? Anybody? Mark Williams, that you went down to talk there. Oh, yes, I went down to talk there. And I was in Tustin, and this woman came wandering into my talk. And I was maybe about 10 minutes in, and I saw this African-American woman sit down in the back. She looked around like, what the heck, what is this? And then I am saying, you know, listen, this is what the research shows. We, we go back, we, we get together with our soul group. There's anywhere from three to 25 people, that's the average. The average is 15. And with our soul members, we choose who we're going to be in our next lifetime. And we might choose difficult lifetimes because we have courage. We're brave. You know, we think we can handle it. And people come here, and sometimes they can't. We have free will. They get here, and they're like, I thought I could take this. Give me those drugs. I can't handle this pain. I thought I could. Okay, that's free will. I thought I could experience this difficult thing that's happened to me. And I've filmed a number of these sessions where all the most atrocious things have happened to people. But in the life between lives, they see that question of compassion. So why did, why did you choose a lifetime that had this much difficulty? Well, I wanted to help my father experience the negativity of his actions. Wow. And in that moment, you forgive people when you see that you participated in that journey, okay? And I was just talking about that stuff. And at the break, this woman came up to me and stuck her finger in my face. And she said, I came in here by accident. I was looking for my incest survivor group. And I just heard what you said. Are you trying to tell me that my daughter went through what she went through as a choice? You know, <sighs> such rage. And you know, what am I gonna say? You know, it's a break, 10 minute break. So I looked her in the eye and I said, you know, thank you. Thank you for having the courage to stay here. Not everybody could do that, go through that. It's easier, check out, my, my spouse is gone. I got stuff to do over there, I'm tired of this. Let me out. It takes courage. Courage to stay here, all of you. And not to steal, it's, I heard Scott say this recently, and I'm, I'm kind of stealing from him, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but it takes courage. You all chose to be here, according to research. You chose to go through what you went through, what you've gone through, what you're going through, what you will go through. You chose it because you felt you could do it. I mean, I didn't give it to it that way, but I 
did say it. Thank you. Then I said, what about your daughter? What's your memory of her? Was she happy? Was she sad? She said she was the happiest child. Would she want you to be unhappy? Would she want you to live the rest of your life in sadness? What do you think? She said, I don't know. I have no idea. I said, well, you know, that's something to think about. How would she want you to be? And if, let's just imagine for a second, it's possible that she's not dead. She's just not here. If you were with her right now, how would you be with her? Would you just be sad and crying and furious and angry? Or would you be happy to see her? She said, I, I gotta go. <laughs> so she, she went and sat down. And uh, I swear to you, it went out of my head. You know, I just, I was trying to speak from the heart. Tried to open the heart chakra in that moment and let my words be wisdom. So I was here at First Press, and this is why we're here today, because I, I got invited to speak here at the, the church. We know Reverend Wood, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy, and they, they, are, they are an open group of people. And they invited me to come speak and talk about my book, and et cetera, et cetera. And I look in the back of the room, and I see somewhere in the middle of this talk, this woman with her hands up like this, you know, like gospel. You know, listen like she's listening. And I thought, oh, you know, is she asking a question? I don't know. I couldn't see. So afterwards, I went up back. That was this woman. She'd come to the talk. Oh, it's you. And she had a copy of the book. And she had every page had a little post-it note. You know, there were post-it notes throughout the book. I said, how are you doing? She said, I just wanted to come down here and thank you in person for saving my life. That's not me. It's research. Right? It's kind of what it is. You know, it's not about you delivering the research. It's about bringing people together in the room. So that's why we're here today. Not that I'm saving anybody's life, but you know, somebody goes, hey, you, come here. <laughs> we need you to go pass this information along. It might actually help somebody. And by the way, she did appear at another IONS group meeting. <laughs> that I spoke to in Los Angeles, she said, you're never going to guess this, I'm doing stand-up. <laughs> <laughs> she was taking a stand-up class, and, you know, and then she told me, like, I went to my incest survivor group, and, and they were like, what happened to you? What, what happened? She said, I just, I don't know, I, something happened. So that's why we're here. We're here because something is happening. We're trying to get, pin it down, we're trying to explore it, we're trying to examine it. And for those of you, for those of you who've never, so how many of you have ever done a meditation before? Guided meditation. Oh, very good, everybody, everybody, excellent, excellent. Sherry, my wife is in the back of the room here. All right, I'm going to tell you a really quick story because um, because I can. That's why. Because I'm in charge. I got the mic. Um, Oh, well, I won't tell what she'll share your story because that'll be embarrassing to you. But listen, well, okay, a little bit. Um, when, you, when you get into this research, you find that people have really preeminent moments in their life that they don't really examine, but they happen. And so if you ask them to examine them, you'll hear the most unusual story. So for example, all of you have had a significant other in your lifetime. And when you ask the question, describe the moment you met that person. Almost always, you have a story that you can tell because you've told it to your relatives. You know, we met on a train, and you know, she didn't, or she didn't notice me. I've asked the question to people, how did you find your wife? And they go, I don't know. You know, I, she worked with me for years, and the next day I went around, she was my married to me. Well, when you really slow it down, slow motion, that moment when you met your significant other, you'll find eternity. You'll find that time when you said, oh, hey, hey, we're going to do this together. And this is what's reported in the research, not me talking. This is the research of what people say, that there's a pre-life planning session, and the people who are going to be connected will say, you know what? I got it. You're going to be wearing a black shirt with three stripes on the shoulder, that moment I'll recognize you. It's the veil will lift, just for that moment. Just so you know this is the person. 
And you've all met somebody where you feel like you've known them for a long time, almost a lifetime. So in my wife's case, when I heard this research, I was like, come on, what are you talking about? And I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sherry and I were sitting at a Starbucks over in Montana. I saw a necklace that she was wearing, and I'm kind of staring at her necklace. What is that? That's weird. And then I'm staring like a long time, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, she catches me staring like this is not the place to be looking with my eyes at somebody I don't know. But I'm looking at her now. Who is that? And then I kind of thought, oh, she's like a teenager. That's weird. I'm staring at a teenager. <laughs> I swear to you, a few seconds went by and I looked again and I was like, no, she's not. She's an adult. That's weird. I, I better talk to her. Then I'll find out. And then I talked to her, and I, I couldn't tell. It's like, I tell you, within about two minutes, I said, you know, why don't we just skip down, get married, and have a couple of kids? <laughs> now, I, she says I say that to everybody at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> but I swear, I never have before. So, really quickly, when my, oh, this wasn't too bad. When our uh, children are kind of magical, who, who was it who said that children now seem to be, Ken talked about it with Galen's idea that children being born today are, seem to be already present on some level. And I'll just tell you a really quick story because I think this helps solidify it on some level to some people. Remember I said I was in Mount Kailash in Western Tibet? I'm shooting a documentary, okay. So this research has also helped me to ask our kids questions or to tell people, ask your kid the question, did you choose us or did we choose you? It helps if it's before the kid is seven or so. And it's funny, you, the answers are hilarious. But you just gotta ask without knowing what the answer's gonna be or judging it. And I'll tell you, when I was working on the movie Salt, I had a New York cop come to me and say, I heard you talking about this past life stuff. <laughs> and can I talk to you? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So he pulled me into a back room and he goes, I think my house is possessed. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's, uh, there's like the devil's look, something. I mean, why do you think that? Well, my daughter, she sees a ghost. It's scaring the shit out of me. And then she starts talking about reincarnation. Like, what's going on? Is she possessed? <laughs> like, okay, first of all, you're talking to a goofy guy on a movie set. So let's just start there. I happen to have done some research in this area, so uh, let me just separate the two things. Who's the ghost? He says, well, that's, that's what's funny. Pardon my bad New York accent. Um, he goes, that's what's funny. The, the ghost, I, I said to her, who is it? What does he look like? And she said, well, he dresses like you, Daddy. <laughs> okay, so it's a cop. So then I was like, who do I know who died? Well, my daughter's eight. My partner died 10 years ago. So I took out a picture of my partner. And she said, well, that's him. I see him in the kitchen. Except he's skinnier and younger. He said to me, how can that be? Skinnier, younger. He died 10 years ago. I said, well, listen. The, the research shows that when between lives you can appear as you want to be, who you want to be. You want to be thinner and younger? Yeah, you can do that. You can appear to people as you think best that wouldn't scare the heck out of them in the kitchen in the morning. So I said, did you like this guy? He said, I loved him. I said, okay, well, is it so bad that the guy you love in life is hanging around keeping an eye on your daughter and you? Not when you put it that way, he said. What about this reincarnation stuff? I said, well, in my experience with kids make up stories about reincarnation or make up stories in anywhere, the, the details are all over the map, they're all over the place. But when you're remembering something, you, at any age, it stays the same relatively. So I said, why don't you just get a map of Australia, open it up and, sh and ask her. That's what she was saying, that she had been born in Australia, or reincarnated in Australia. Why don't you just get a map? So he did that. He came in the next day, grabbed me by the shirt, dragged me in the room, locked the door. He said, you're not going to believe this. But he had taken out a map of Australia, and his daughter had pointed to Perth, and had said, there. We were from Perth. I was a farmer. My whole family died in a drought. And then she burst into tears. 
And it was the first time this seasoned cop had ever asked his, quest, asked his daughter a question he didn't know the answer to. So that was powerful for her to be able to share that for him. Okay. Um, all right. All right, just three more minutes and then we'll wrap it up. Basically, uh, in a nutshell, my son, when he was two, I said, uh, RJ, he was here earlier, I said, RJ, do you, did, uh, did you know Danny from before? He said, yeah. I said, from where? He said, too bad. Too bad. Where in too bad? On the path. Path. I've never used the word path in my life with him. Oh, I forgot to say when he was when he was two. First thing, he, I was on the phone with him. I was in Chicago, and the first sentence he said to me was, "Dad, I was a monk in Nepal." I said, "Put your mother on the phone." <laughs> Why did he say that? She's like, "I have no idea." So now this is a year later. I'm in the car. He's three, and I say, "You know, did you know me?" He said, "Yeah, from Tibet on the path." And then I was like, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute!" When I was in Tibet on Mount Kailash. Robert Thurman had said, if you make a wish on this spot, it'll come true. So I was going to wish for a million dollars or a three-picture deal. Very clearly, that was my choice. It would be money. It would be money. I couldn't make up my mind. I said, well, whatever comes out of my mouth, that's going to be my wish. What came out of my mouth was, I want a son. <laughs> Excuse me? Really didn't know where the sentence came from. We had a daughter. I was like, oh, that must be a masculine. You know, I'm up at this altitude, it just comes out. I'm just outside. Really no connection to it, but now I'm in the car with him, the sun. And I go, you mean, you mean Mount Kailash? And he goes, no. I was like, oh, okay. Not a Mount Kailash, a path in Tibet. Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of paths. Do you mean Kambra? He said, yeah, it was Kambra. Kambra is the name of the path where I made the wish. He said, it's in Tibet. He once had a friend over at our house, and, and he pointed to a Tibetan mandala, and he said, I used to speak that language, I just don't talk it anymore. <laughs> then when he was four, I was working on this movie, Salt, in New York City, and I settled in an apartment in the city, and Sherry and the kids came, and he was looking through the books of this guy's apartment, he found a couple of books, he pulled them out, he took one, he threw it in the trash. She said, what are you doing? He said, worthless. That book is worthless. This is the important one. And it was Robert Thurman's book, Circling the Sacred Mountain, with a picture of Kailash. He pointed to it and said, that's where I found Daddy. He, he didn't read. And a year later, Sherry and I were up in Topanga Canyon in a Tibet shop. She comes up, she says, where's RJ? I'm like, what do you mean? He's disappeared. Come on, the shop is like half the size of this room. Where could he be? She comes back a few minutes later, this look on her face. Oh, I put some her. She said, I found him. He's in the back room doing full prostrations. <laughs> all the way, I can't do it. All the way down to the ground, forehead to the ground, all the way back up, all the way down to the ground, all the way back up. And then he sees her in the mirror and goes, oh, like he's caught. Mom. You need to meditate more, and this is how you do it. And then he pulled her down and he said, you hear the bells and the music, the Tibetan bells ringing? That means peace has come into the world. So I asked the Tibetan friend, what does it mean when a Tibetan bell rings? Peace comes into the world. Well, I, he knew that, I did not. All right, finally, and this is our last moment. Uh, my mom was about to pass away a couple of Octobers ago. And I sat my kids down because I got the call from the caregiver saying, you know, she's not going to make the weekend. And I remembered my first funeral. So I said, you know what, guys? Um, the next time you see grandma, she's not going to be grandma. She's going to be like in a box, you know, makeup on and stuff. Just wanted you to be okay with that. And he says, Dad, spirit is like water. Watch. He picked up an arrowhead bottle, about half full, showed it to me, the water in there, he threw it on the ground, and then he stomped on it. And then he got both feet up and down, stomping, 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 crushing this bottle. I looked at Sherry. We were like, what the, what is he doing? 
and he picked up this crumpled, crumpled bottle. Crumpled, but the cap was still on. And he said, you see, the water's okay. Easily the most profound teaching <laughs> I've ever heard about spirit. The water is okay. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much. And stick around. <laughs>